welcome back, and uh, we'll start the uh, you know the discussion part of uh, this with uh, some uh, words by uh, Dr. Tanabe. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Thank you for having me um, <clears throat> respond to uh, to Jeff Wilson. It's a pleasure to meet you. It's a uh, even greater pleasure to hear. Such a clear lecture. I mean, wasn't that a relief? You know, you always worry about university professors. You know, they go, oh, you know, they go over like this. You know, and you kind of wonder uh, what what they're talking about. But Jeff was just so, so, uh, so clear, and uh, understandable, and and very insightful. Uh, his his analysis of the the situation um, <clears throat> historically as well as in in contemporary terms. Uh, I think is, is, is really uh, spot on. And I think that's one of the reasons why we found his uh, talk uh, so understandable, because we could relate to it. We could say, oh yeah, right, sure. You know, there's, there, there are all of these, these situations that we, uh, that we recognize and can uh, relate to. And so it was very easy to understand. So thank you for, for uh, showing that uh, academic eggheads can actually speak clearly uh, <laughs> every now and then, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> uh, I used to tell my students there are no stupid questions, there are only stupid answers. Uh, <clears throat> and actually, like you, I, I didn't really believe what I was saying. <laughs> but there's, I want to also make a comment about something that you said, and, and I don't know if this was inadvertent on your part, but um, you were kind of paraphrasing the... Um, that, that, that uh, wonderful saying that if uh, bad people can go to the pure land, uh, how much, uh, I mean, if, if good people can go to the pure land, how much more so bad people? And you said if Japanese Americans can go to the pure land, how much more so Howleys? I would reverse it. If Howleys can go to the pure land, then how much more so Japanese Americans? <laughs> Turn that around. <clears throat> anyway, you treated uh, Jodo Shinshu in your analysis from, from two perspectives. One was the cultural institutional. That was the first half of your, uh, of, of your talk. And that was the part in which, even though you said that Jodo Shinshu has been a success in America, by your own description and by your own accounting, it has been a qualified uh, success. You know, it hasn't really made it. You know, it's, it's not so much a form of American Buddhism as it is Japanese Buddhism in America. And so, as, as you d described it, you know, it's still kind of stuck in patterns of the past. It still seems like a kind of uh, exclusive uh, ethnic uh, club. <clears throat> and so it really hasn't broken out of its uh, Japanese uh, cultural and institutional uh, context. And so when we talk about Jodo Shinshu, we can talk about it <clears throat> in terms of its cultural institutional aspects, and that's where the problem is. That's where it comes across as so much being still a Japanese uh, institution. And that's what keeps a lot of non-Japanese away because they look at it and they don't see an American religion. They see a Japanese uh, religion. And it's, it's foreign. It's foreign to them. You know, the symbolism is foreign. A lot of the language is foreign. <clears throat> Many of the priests are foreign. Uh, <clears throat> and the ties to, uh, to, to Japan are still very, very strong, as, as um, we've said many, many times over uh, here in Hawaii. We still don't have the kind of independence from the mother country that Japan has from China, that China has from India. So we're still tied to, uh, to Japan, and it looks like uh, a Japanese uh, religion. And that's part of the problem that makes the success of Jodo Shinshu in America a qualified uh, success. And it was more successful if we judge success by numbers of members uh, in the past than it is in the, in the, in the present. And as you point out, you know, the numbers are going down demographically. <clears throat> it's, a, it's a pretty bleak uh, picture with fewer and fewer uh, younger people coming in, mostly older people who are remaining. And so uh, the, the success you describe is, is, is a qualified success. And the reason for that is because Culturally and institutionally, Jodo Shinshu is still tied in with uh, Japan, not America, yet. Al although there are, and, and you mentioned some of the ways in which 
uh, Jodo Shinshu in Hawaii and America is, is different from culturally and institutionally from Jodo Shinshu in, in Japan. So it's not exactly the same. And after a, a, what, about 100 years now, certainly we have made different kinds of accommodations and adaptations uh, to Hawaii so that we're, we're not a carbon copy, but still, you know, the, the ties are, are very strong. Okay, <clears throat> the second point y you made, or in the second half of your talk, is about the universal side. So this is in contrast to the cultural institutional side, which is still kind of Japanese, or maybe very Japanese. In terms of the teaching, it's universal. That's the part that can become American, or Canadian, or German, or Italian, whatever. That's the part that is universal. And the teaching is universal. Um, you, you describe the Jodo Shinshu universalism, this inner relatedness, this sort of um, way in which uh, everything <coughs> is seen as being tied in together, you know, even the devil, even Mara can, can, be, uh, can be saved. And so there isn't a division of the world into those who are forever damned and those who are saved, but you know, this, this inclusiveness, this universal inclusiveness. Now we're no longer talking about Japan or, or even America. We're talking about <coughs> a universal uh, teaching. And so when we look at Joro Shinshu, we see uh, the teaching, we see this universal side, and that's a side that's the kind of the hopeful side uh, as to how it is that we can break out of the Japanese mold. So, put the two and two together. You have a, a, a still heavily Japanese uh, institution that has a universal message. So how are you going to get that universal message out? Because what keeps a lot of people from coming to that universal message is that cultural institutional identity of the temple as being a Japanese temple. And of course, and I know I've been saying this for many, many years, and uh, it's something that I learned from Al Bloom, so if it's wrong, it's his fault. <laughs> And that is that the institution has to become more American culturally and institutionally. This part, I won't blame you, Al, but you know, what it comes down to is we have to, in very real ways, cut our ties from Japan. Now, I know that's a hard you know, uh, thing to, to do, um, but anyway, we, we've, we've talked about that many times uh, <clears throat> in, the, uh, in the past. I guess my question to you, Jeff, would be your claim uh, or your description of this universalism as being uniquely Jodo Shinshu. And it seems to me that it's uh, really part of the common ground of Mahayana Buddhism. And so if we look at uh, Kegon, the very early form of Buddhism in Japan, you know, we see this, this, this interrelatedness. Muga, there's no obstruction. Um, the idea of, of uh, Indra's net, that the net is all knotted, and each knot there's a jewel, and each jewel has many facets. You look in one jewel, you see all jewels. So this whole idea that there is one in everything and everything in one. It's a very, very old Mahayana idea and not particularly unique to Jodo Shinshu. This is where Jodo Shinshu really finds itself as part of this larger family of Mahayana Buddhas. We can go to Shingon Buddhism and see very similar ideas. In fact, talk about the salvation of devils. Shingon Buddhists love to say that in their mandalas, uh, the picture of the entire cosmos, <clears throat> where all the different Buddhas are listed there. If you look very carefully in the margins, you will see demons, that even the demons are part of the so-called sacred order. So, you know, this is this real inclusiveness and, and interrelatedness is something that we see in Zen Buddhism uh, as well. Uh, so in all of the other sects of Buddhism, 
And maybe this is a good reason why we should study some of the other sects and denominations of Buddhism, because then we might find out not only that we have differences, but we also have common ground. And the strong point of Jodo Shinshu, as described by Jeff, and I would agree that that's the strong point, is also the strong point of Zen and Shingon and Tendai and Nichiren and all of those other Buddhisms that have in their teaching this idea that we're all related, we're all tied in one with another. There's no way in which we can separate ourselves out, so we better start working together <clears throat> and start um, thinking positively of the people we don't like. Great exercise. <laughs> uh, yeah, my list was too long. I couldn't figure out on who to concentrate on. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <clears throat> so, you know, th th there's a way in which um, uh, th th there's, there's, th there are differences, of course, and, and there are similarities uh, between the denominations, just as there is a difference between Japanese Buddhism and American religion, or even American Buddhism, and the the, uh, on the one hand, and yet the common ground on the other hand of this kind of universal interrelatedness. So um, I, I thought it was a really clear analysis in terms of what the problem is in terms of the cultural institutional identity of the institution and what the promise is in terms of this uh, universal teaching. So how to get the teaching out, and of course, it's going to be through, uh, through outreach. Um, but here's the part, and, and I've, I've argued, and I've, I've sort of taken a little bit of a different angle from uh, Jeff in terms of looking at this universalism as being common to other forms of Buddhism. That is to say, it is not unique to Jodo Shinshu. What I think is unique to Jodo Shinshu is one of its great challenges. And you mentioned going to the bookstore and finding a lot of books on Tibetan Buddhism and Zen Buddhism, but very few on, on uh, and, and Jodo Shinshu. And I think there's a reason for that. And the reason is Jodo Shinshu doesn't have, officially speaking, a practice. A lot of people love Buddhism for its practice. Tibetan ritual, Zen meditation. Now, not everybody is into that, and there is a market, I think, and I'm, I'm really anxious to hear you this afternoon because I think maybe you're gonna be talking about how it is that this uh, you know, religion without a practice, this Buddhism without a practice, namely Jodo Shinshu, uh, can be marketed, so to speak, can be propagated, can be made more popular in the wider uh, community. But Tibetan Buddhism and Zen Buddhism have very rich forms of ritual and practice, and that appeals to a lot of people. And that's why I think those books are, <coughs> are uh, prevalent in, in the bookstores as opposed to Jodo Shinshu, which has, in a way, kind of an idea. You know, uh, everybody can be embraced by, by Amida, but what practice is there? Just the practice of gratitude? Well, gratitude is, is you know, everybody's practice. I mean, you don't have to be Buddhist even to be stressing the practice of gratitude. Every parent teaches their child, their children. Uh, every school teaches their students, you know, the, the virtue of, of gratitude. So, so that's not uh, unique. So I think that the uniqueness of Jodo Shinshu, namely its lack of practice, is the great challenge. So now the question becomes very specifically, how do you propagate a form of Buddhism that has very little, if any at all, uh, form of practice. And I think that's kind of the big challenge of, of, uh, of Jodo Shinshu. So I know all of you have uh, questions and comments to make, um, but I thought his two-part uh, analysis was, was, um, was spot on. Um, taking a little different angle in terms of characterizing the, uh, the universalism 
of, of, uh, of Jodo Shinshu, but uh, overall, I think the situation we have is really, really clear, thanks to, uh, to Jeff Stahl. Namely, we've got a universal message that is kind of locked into a ethnocentric institution, and so the question becomes, you know, how to, how to, how to, how to negotiate those two sides, you know, to, to break out of it. You talked about uh, media, of getting the word out, and uh, let me end with a little story. Again, going back to my long association with uh, Al Bloom, who has given me so much trouble <laughs> over the years. And the reason is because he's, he is so full of ideas. You know, he'll say, come, let's do this. And one of the things he did to me when I first came to UH, he'd already been here, was he said, oh, he's got this radio program called Buddhist Outreach on Keizu. And so we used to go down there <laughs> to the station and, and broadcast, half hour broadcast, reaching out you know, to, to the wider community. And the problem, as I saw it, was that our program followed the Club Yoko Hour. <laughs> and Club Yoko was a, was a well-known bar down oh. by Kewalo Basin. <clears throat> And you know they're broadcasting in, in Japanese, and they're playing these really sentimental songs, and the, this really you know sexy voice would come on the air and say, "Oh, you sailors out there!" And they knew, I guess they had the shipping list, you know, <clears throat> they knew exactly what ships were there. Oh, you sailors in the nani nani maru, uh, I bet you can't wait to come to Honolulu. You must be so lonely. Uh, <clears throat> well, here at Club Yoko, we're waiting for you. <laughs> you know, all of that. And then, you know, they, they, they would end, you know, the, the broadcast. And then Al and I would come on. Welcome to Buddhist Outreach. <laughs> I could hear across the Pacific the radio is going off, you know, <laughs> click, 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 click. <laughs> Who would want to hear us? <laughs> so I, I guess it's a part of, of marketing, you know, it's a part of, you know, how do you, how do you, how do you put that message out in a way <clears throat> that people are not going to uh, turn off uh, the radio? Well, let me stop here. <clears throat> um, and, and maybe you'd like to respond to some of my comments, and then we can open it up uh, to, the, uh, to, to the whole audience. All right, great. Uh, is this still on? Is this broadcasting right here? OK, great. I'll just use this. It's on. still clipped to it. OK. All right, great. Well, thank you very much. Um, yeah, basically what I got out of that uh, response was, um, Shein Buddhism needs to be sexier. <laughs> OK. So I guess that will be the, the topic of this afternoon's talk. You promised. Yeah. <laughs> Uh-oh. OK. Yeah, I'll, I'll uh, start taking off some of this. Uh, no, nobody wants that. OK. All right, let's see here. Um, did, OK, sorry, I thought I was hearing some feedback from, uh, from this. I guess it must not be. All right, um, so uh, here we'll, we'll do the little academic thing we do at conferences, where somebody says something, and then somebody raises their qualifications, and then you respond to them, and that sort of thing. I, I can't help doing this. This is part of our academic culture. But um, um, I'd also like, though, to have a chance to hear back from everybody else as well. So uh, a, couple of, a couple of the comments there. Um, uh, yeah, thank you for that response. That was helpful. Also, that was good because I, I, I learned what I talked about. So uh, uh, it's, it's good to have a refresher then to uh, figure out what I was trying to say. Um, uh, one thing on this idea of uh, Jodo Shinshu as being unique in this sort of universalism, I think I should probably try to zero in on what it is I'm trying to say and what I'm not trying to say then so that I don't sort of mislead on this. Um, uh, Dr. Tanabe is um, absolutely correct that the idea of uh, sort of how would we say it, like the liberation of all beings or an inclusiveness of all beings in, in a sort of vision is fundamental to Mahayana Buddhism across the board. So these things like Kegon he talked about, or Zen, or uh, uh, Shingon, all of these are Mahayana forms or come, come out or further elaborations from the Mahayana tradition originally. So yeah, this is, a, this is a type of Buddhism, and this is the larger form of Buddhism, Mahayana, um, very diverse form. But it certainly is 
sort of universalistic in some way, um, pervasively, absolutely. Um, and and that's, a, that's an important thing to recognize, and that's also a, a wonderful thing. It means that there are universalistic resources that could be brought forward in all these traditions. Um, I think what I'm trying to um, uh, stress here then is not that it's uniquely universalistic, but that it's um, unique in the, in the way in which that universalism um, uh, is, is really core and plays a, plays a strong role in the sort of raison d'etre of the creation of the Shin movement in the first place. Like, when I think of these other forms of Buddhism, and um, I study them uh, both historically and you know, I've been to their temples and explored them uh, for myself uh, in the contemporary world as well, all, all of the ones that were brought up, and um, I, I really appreciate them. I really love the richness of Buddhism. Um, but at the same time, in general, these other forms of Mahayana Buddhism um, don't, don't nearly as much um, provide, um, uh, how would I quite put this? Um, they're, not, they're not as focused on that sort of universalism in a way. So like uh, Kegon Buddhism is a, um, is a very um, abstract, very philosophical type of Buddhism um, with a very lovely sort of visionary quality to it, but also inherently a Buddhism basically of the elite. The Kegon never developed itself into a Buddhism of the masses. So it, it has a wonderful vision for the extremely small number of people who are able to plow their way through the Kegon Sutra and, and to really work on this sort of thing, right? This is a, a very elite sort of Buddhism. Um, and it's that sort of, the way in which these Buddhisms, they will, they will gesture towards universalism, but then they don't have kind of a program to enable to put that vision into action. That is where I think there, there's a kind of a division there. So for example, um, uh, Shingon, uh, this is a tantric Japanese Buddhism, or Zen, two forms that came up as well. Um, these are really, uh, really incredible, um, uh, very fascinating forms of Buddhism. But they're also, at least in what they understand to be their important practices, they are also limited very much to an elite, right? Now, there are lay practitioners of Shingon and lay practitioners of Zen, particularly Soto, very much so. But at the same time, the rhetoric within those sects is that the important practices, the higher level practices, um, you basically require uh, monastic training and this sort of thing, something that is, cannot be delivered to the average member, and indeed there's no attempt to deliver it to the average member. The average member of these groups is um, uh, doing mantras and um, you know, um, uh, uh, involved in uh, charitable acts or some ritual, this sort of stuff, but not, not, high, not, in, the, not in the core liberating um, what practices of the sects themselves. Um, and for those few people who are able to do it, there's a real differentiation, right? When, it, when in Shingon, if you're really doing those practices, you're, you're, you're qualified as a, a, a tantric master, right? So you're something, you're, you're, a, a, you know, you're, you're a daishi, you're, you're someone of a higher rank than other people. And in Zen, of course, we've all heard this term, Zen master, right? So you're, you're, you're the rare, unique person who has uh, broken through, achieved satori, you know, or kinsho, and has had some vision of this universality. So that as in master, um, it isn't just abstract, like hopefully, at least if they have an authentic awakening, they even operate out of this sort of vision, in, in experiential, they, they, they realize this interconnectedness of all things. But by definition, by the fact that we call them masters, it means that the, the number of people who really have this is shrinkingly small, you know, in their own forms of Buddhism. So those are Buddhisms that are, um, they do have that kernel of the universalism in them, but they're not designed, and they, they, they're, they're explicit about this, they're not designed to deliver that universalism actually on a universal level to all people. On the other hand, the thing, as I understand it, that Shinran was doing was specifically going to the Nimbutsu, not because he thought Nimbutsu was awesome in the abstract, but because he recognized that Nimbutsu was something that could be accessed by everybody, including even one such as himself, since he saw himself as being you know, not at all a perfect sort of person. So if Nimbutsu could save even someone like him, then it could also liberate uh, peasants and women and the masses and all the people on the outside of Buddhism in his own day, right? So he was, to me, really almost uniquely um, um, fulfilling that universal vision that is common across Mahayana. Now, you know, we, we can try to look at the details. I, I, you know, of course, it's always messier than that. But that's what I'm trying to say. It's not that it's, it's um, 
um, rare in its universal vision. It's, it's rare in the degree in which it can consistently tried to, to apply it to such a wide field. And actually, that's again the reason why today, when our vision seems to have shrunk so much, where, where now it's just kind of like another type of Japanese Buddhism, um, uh, uh, that's to me uh, not consistent with the spirit of the founder himself, who, like I said, he, you know, Shinran didn't intend to just save the Japanese in this sort of way. He was in Japan, that's why he saved the Japanese. It wasn't, there's nothing ever in his writings that say, Amida embraces the Japanese, you know? It's never what he says. He doesn't even, he doesn't say Amida embraces the Japanese or Amida ja embraces the Chinese or even Amida embraces Asians or anything like this. He doesn't even say Amida embraces humans. I mean, he talks about all beings all the time. If you were someone like uh, uh, Dr. Bloom who actually goes through these writings and you know pulls out all the sections where he says something on a theme. Like I have to say, you know, the number of times he says Amida's light shines on all beings or Amida embraces everyone, that'd be like Essential Shinran Volume 2. It'd be like just its own book just on that one theme, I think. So that's what I'm trying to get out there. But it is actually quite an important corrective, I think, that Dr. Tanabe brings up here that um, this is nonetheless common to Mahayana Buddhism. And so therefore, um, you know, if we set ourselves up on a kind of a high horse, like, ooh, we're the universal Buddhists, and they're the, they're the partial Buddhists, that sort of stuff. And that's like defeating the whole purpose right there, too. So I, I hope, please, that not at all this will be taken as uh, trying to denigrate other types of Buddhism. They also have that vision. And if sometimes we feel like they haven't fulfilled it, well, number one, we haven't fulfilled it either. And number two, the fact that they have it means that we can encourage them to increasingly emphasize that if it's something that we value. Um, one other little thing I just wanted to mention uh, on here, I have actually a, a slightly different analysis on why there aren't Shin books on, um, on the bookshelves. I definitely think the practice thing is one part of it, but here the historian of American Buddhism just can't, can't help but um, talk about having kind of looked at, at the uh, tradition, and uh, here's what I think is also going on with that. This is just kind of FYI. I could probably tell you this at lunch, but too late. I already started. OK. All right. I think that a main reason why we have almost no books on Jodo Shinshu on the shelves, but we do have books on Zen and Tibetan Buddhism in particular, I think that <clears throat> this may seem a little counterintuitive at the beginning, but I think this is right. There were lots and lots of Shin Buddhists in America, and that's why there are no books for them. OK. Now, what do I mean by this? There's lots of Shin books in English. We've all been writing them and publishing them with our own presses and consuming them at our own temples in our own communities. We've never tried to put them on the bookshelves. Why? Shin Buddhism has historically never had a need to be a missionary faith in North America because it came built in with a large constituency already. It came with a large immigrant population originally and therefore it focused its energies on retaining its market share of that um, immigrant population and their descendants, basically. So it produced uh, uh, resources for those people in their communities. And there was no need to go outside them because there were enough people until now where, actually, well, until 20 years ago, but we, we weren't paying attention when we kind of passed that tipping point. Um, um, now, now there is a need to go to them, and we're having to struggle to throw off 100 years of like willfully not even trying really realistically as, a, as an entire movement. I'm not saying there haven't been individuals, but as a movement to try to incorporate other people. Why then do we have the Zen and the Tibetan things? Because there's nobody here who does Zen or Tibetan. By that I mean, how many Tibetans are there in America? I've seen the immigration figures. Um, Tibetan started coming here, this is 2010, so um, they've been coming here for about 60 years, and there's only a few thousand of them out of the 312 million um, Americans. This, there's something like uh, five to 7,000 Tibetans. So because there were no Tibetans in America, that's why Tibetan Buddhism had to, without a built-in constituency, had to learn how to become missionary. So that, that, that meant that they started talking in English earlier and started looking for ways to get non-Tibetans into their uh, centers earlier, you know? 
um, they didn't have any choice. If they wanted to be here, they had to get new people involved. And on the other hand, because there were no Tibetans, by no, obviously, I mean, there were not a critical mass of them, there are no Tibetans making Tibetan Buddhism much easier for non-Tibetans to appropriate for their own uses. I think it's the same thing with Zen. Zen was a very, very small minority of the Japanese population that came over here. Not saying it wasn't there. Certainly, there, there's been Zen temples for a long time. But very, very few compared to the Hongganju tradition, much, much larger. And so this very small number of Zen temples didn't need to you know, didn't even really have any ability to reach out uh, further than where they were. So it was when Zen people came over and went out into wider America without a constituency, they had to learn how to put Zen into English, and they had to learn how to market Zen to others. So what did they market? They didn't market the same sort of ancestor worship and um, omamoris and all the kind of stuff that's actually all the stuff you find at Zen temples in, in Japan. They marketed Zazen, you know, meditation, this sort of stuff because they learned that that's what would get them new, new practitioners. We just never had to do that. We had, we had the, the problem of having too many good Buddhists to start with. <laughs> you see here? So I think that's part of what was going on with that. And then we've, even when we passed a kind of tipping point where we were on the downslope and we needed to bring more people in, We'd, for so many generations, been operating in this mentality, oh, we got everybody we need. Let's just hold on to what we got, and we'll make it through somehow, this sort of stuff. We can just see it, losing strategy. But it takes a long time to kind of admit that to yourself. So I think that's part of what's going on. But then the practice side is part of it, too. And then to wrap up my comments here, then, what I'm going to talk about this afternoon ties directly into this. Because we don't have a kind of a, a, a sexy practice like meditation to try to uh, market to people to be the panacea. You know, we don't say chant Nimbutsu and it will um, uh, it'll make you healthier. You know, like it'll lower your blood pressure and um, you'll achieve like cosmic oneness or it'll it'll um, it'll make you better at basketball. You know, the, all the stuff that people use Zen for in America today, right? I mean, that's, that's what uh, uh, Phil Jackson used to, to take the, the, the Bulls to the championship, was Zen meditation. Well, you know, we could, have, we could say that about Nimbutsu, and uh, maybe we'd feel great if people started doing it. Uh, but on the other hand, that's not even the real Nimbutsu that Shinran's talking about. It wouldn't be Jodo Shinshu at that point anymore. So what I'm going to talk about then is how we might be able to bring Shin values and attitudes rather than Shin doctrine or Japanese terminology to, to non-Buddhists. If we don't have a practice, per se, to market, then it really, Jodo Shinshu, comes down to those, um, those attitudes, those values, those uh, emotional orientations, those, those kind of heart things that I'm trying to gesture towards. And that's what we then need to learn to convey to others, rather than um, Namu Amida Butsu, specifically. Okay? So uh, that's a little teaser for what I'll talk about this afternoon. Um, even just hearing Dr. Tanabe's um, comments though, helps me to figure out what I ought to try to be speaking towards also this afternoon. So thank you very much. OK, all right. And then, now I just blabbed for like 10, 15 minutes. Um, so let me see. Do we still have a few minutes that we could um, get some Q&A from the audience? I'd love to do that. Dr. Wilson, it's my understanding that you were brought up in a universalist Christian type of, uh, with a universalist Christian type of background. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about your journey towards Shin Buddhism? And do you find much commonality between your universalist Christian upbringing and your Shin Buddhist presentation Buddhist belief? Sure, okay, uh, very good question. Am I still on? Okay, all right. Um, first, I, I should probably try to clarify. Um, uh, the religion that I was brought up in is uh, Unitarian Universalism. Uh, this is a denomination which emerged uh, from Protestant Christianity, historically, but by the time that I was born into it, it had uh, long since ceased to be Christian. So I, I did not grow up Christian and have never actually been Christian at any point in my life. Uh, the Christians were the kids who would beat me up and tell me I was going to hell on the playground since I wasn't Christian. <laughs> So, um, uh, so it's funny to be, be lumped in with them. Um, they would not like that, uh, whereas I think it's rather funny. So um, anyways, um, uh, you know, uh, basically I was raised as a Unitarian. Uh, you guys have Unitarians out here too. Uh, I mean, Obama used to go to the Unitarian church here in town, right? 
uh, sometimes with his grandma. So um, I know that, uh, uh, at least there may be some familiarity with that. I was born in Hartford, Connecticut, and New England is ground zero for the Unitarian Universalists. Um, they, they're derived originally from, from the Puritans who got off the ships in 1630. So you know, this is, a, this, is, this is kind of the liberal wing of the Puritans to the point where they eventually, you know, they went so far to the left, they, they left uh, the building uh, and ceased to be Christian after a certain point. So that was, that was, the, that was what I grew up with. Um, it's very mainstream there, even though I know it's not nearly as common out here. But there's a Unitarian Universalist church in uh, any town of any size. There were two in my town you know, growing up. So it's very normal out, out in that part of the country. Um, yeah, you know, I do think that that has influenced my understanding of Shin Buddhism. And it certainly influenced my, my presentation of Shin Buddhism. Um, because that's, that's as old an American faith as you could hope to find. I mean, it goes back to the Puritans, right? We're, we're, you know, unless you're going to be Native American, you can't get much further back than that. So um, uh, it's, it's, it's very Americanized. It's a very liberal form of religion. So it is very flexible, meaning that it looks, uh, it adapts to the times uh, fairly easily. Um, and so I, I think that there's um, a lot of that uh, that informs my, uh, my, my thinking uh, when I think about Jodo Shinshu. At, at the same time, and I, I remain involved uh, with that denomination because, you know, this is not, uh, it's not a religion where, um, you know, you, you, you can only be that and you can't be something else, you know? Um, so it's very easy for me to continue to, uh, to do that. We go to the Unitarian Universalist Church uh, most Sundays, actually, because uh, we don't live anywhere near uh, Jodo Shinshu Temple. So, uh, for the sake of my wife and for uh, our kids who need some, you know, other kids and some, uh, uh, you know, sort of uh, basic religious instruction, we tend to go to the, to the church because it's in our town uh, rather than the temple, which is uh, over an hour away in, in Toronto. Uh, we go there about once a month because I nonetheless do want them to be exposed regularly uh, to the Dharma as much as I can. So um, anyways, um, you were also kind of asking about my process, about how I went into Shin Buddhism. Let me talk about that, because that's probably not as boring as me rambling about Unitarians. Um, basically, I was, I was a, quite an active Unitarian Universalist until I went to college. And um, they do not do much in the way of um, uh, uh, college um, uh, missions, or whatever you might say. Um, so uh, there wasn't really a campus group or anything. So I was, I was young. I was off on my own for the first time. And um, it had been a very important part of my childhood. But now I was kind of like, right when my life was making its biggest changes, I was without any sort of community. So of course, that left me available to uh, uh, groups that, that were present at the time. Uh, didn't go into Christianity. They had their campus groups, but I was not interested in that. I, I'm still remembering the bruises from the uh, schoolyard. So um, actually, I did join the Jewish group. Um, I'm not Jewish, but they had catered events. So I went with, I went to the, all their events. Um, that you know, it was good uh, kosher food. It was uh, high quality, and I um, actually would bring my backpack with an empty Tupperware in it. And um, you know, what can I say? You know, when you're 18, 19, you you don't have a lot of money to spend on food. So. Uh, I would, uh, you know, uh, socialize, and then when, you know, uh, it was kind of winding down, just start shoveling that into the backpack, and, you know, then I had uh, food for the next day, too. So, uh, but that, I didn't stick with them. Uh, I wasn't interested uh, religiously, really, in that group. I'm sort of embarrassed to tell that story, I realize now, <laughs> but I already did, too late. Um, I got an interested in, in Buddhism um, and the academic level, originally, while I was in college. And I did uh, Buddhist studies while I was in college. Um, and it so happened that there was a, a, a basically a Zen type of um, a Buddhist meditation group at my, at my college. And that was the only Buddhist opportunity there. And um, the Unitarians weren't doing anything in the area. So I started going to that meditation group also. Um, and uh, uh, you know, I, I became interested in, in kind of Zen Buddhism through that. And I was involved in Zen Buddhism uh, for a number of years. Um, and that was my original Buddhist um, sort of location. Uh, was Zen. I, I found it very interesting. Um, it's a very beautiful tradition, um, uh, amazing sort of history, very interesting texts, um, very interesting practices. And um, um, I did that for a number of years. Uh, I graduated from college, moved to New York City, and uh, attended some of the Zendos there in, uh, in, in the city. Um, but what I found over time was um, 
uh, Zen Buddhism, which is a, a self-power sort of practice. In fact, maybe it's the self-power practice par excellence. You know, you sit down, you know, and, and you you meditate without moving, no matter what happens. You know, if someone yells at you, if the house catches on fire, if they're smacking you with a stick, whatever, you meditate. You meditate like a mountain, Im immobile, um, unmovable, um, and uh, you try to break through. Um, your mental delusions and achieve for yourself this sort of um, uh, amazing sort of uh, uh, Buddhist awakening. Um, it's a very attractive sort of path in that way because especially as a, as a young man in New York City, I felt like, you know, hey, I can conquer the world and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this thing. I'll become a Zen master and then I'll be better than everybody else, you know, and uh, I'll be able to handle New York, which is kind of a crazy place. And uh, so I tried very hard uh, to do that sort of thing. Um, but I found that... Um, the better I got at Zen, the more my ego increased. So as I got to the point where I could meditate for long periods of time without moving, then my brain would say to me, you know, um, oh, you're getting so good at meditation. That guy over there, look at him, he's moving. He's thinking about something, he's not meditating, he's obviously thinking about something. Look at him, he's asleep. That guy is busy watching the bug crawling up the wall and everything. So, you know, I started to get very uh, highfalutin about all this sort of thing, right? And I would read these uh, Zen texts, which are very difficult to understand, um, but I would read them, and over time I began to really understand them, and I could also kind of talk the talk, you know, because I'd read so much of this stuff. So I could go around and, you know, someone asked me about Zen, I would say, what is the sound of one hand clapping? And then I would like give some sort of plausible answer, say it's you know it's all bull, but uh, you know nobody nobody else knew either, so you know I kind of got, got away with it. So the better I got at that kind of you know at least appearing like I was Zen, I would say to myself, oh look at how good I am at Zen. All oh, these these morons don't get it, but Jeff he's got it. Okay, you know, and so so my ego kept getting bigger and bigger. The better I got, and um, you know people started asking me to talk about Zen, and I started writing and this sort of stuff. Um, but on a certain level, it's all very false because the problem in Buddhism is yourself, especially your self-attachment. It is that egoism. That's what causes suffering in the first place. Um, I was also very strict about the precepts at the time, stricter than, than most Zen Buddhists are, as a matter of fact. Um, I was a vegan, I was a, a, a vegetarian um, uh, with an attitude, basically. And um, uh, I didn't drink, uh, which was extremely unusual for people from my hometown. And, and just in general, I was, I was a total teetotaler and, and um, uh, a, a real uh, wet blanket at parties, what can I say? So um, in all of that, I thought I was you know, really great and I, I could follow the precepts and everything. So eventually I reached a point where I realized, no, this is, this is, this is totally wrong. You know, the, the more Zen I do, the, the worse of a human being I become. You know, this is terrible. And it's not necessarily something that's wrong with Zen, okay? Maybe this is me, who is a very egoistic sort of person, um, uh, uh, you know, taking the worst aspects of Zen and using them to, to reinforce my ego in that sort of way. But at the same time, I have to say, I was a young person, I was looking around at other Zen practitioners who'd been doing the Zen meditation, and meditation is what's supposed to, at the end of the day, free you, right? And I was seeing people who were, uh, so I'm in my early 20s, and there were people in their 50s or so. So they've been doing it maybe 20, 30 years, that sort of stuff. And I could see a lot of them had the same sort of, were displaying the same things I was too. So I th thought to myself, wait a minute, I'm getting worse and worse. This is, this is really bad. And these people have been doing it for 30 years, and they're still pretty bad too, you know? And they're New Yorkers. Like, if a New, if a New Yorker is a jerk, you know it, because he's just he's in your face about it, right? So um, at least there's, there's that I can say that's probably good about them. So I thought to myself, you know, I might put in 30 years, and I might come out the other end of this in practice worse than I am right now. You know, that's this is this is not going to work, basically. So um, I was actually sort of very I was very uh, disappointed, very crestfallen by this. Um, I felt uh, bereft, basically. It was like a like a loss or something because. I realized that I'd been putting in effort for a number of years, and a uh, number of years is not super long, but I had really hardcore been working on this. And um, I realized you know, my relationships with my family, with my friends, with other people were deteriorating because of this. You know, like I said, I'm turning into a total jerk in this scenario. So um, I put in all this effort, and it was maybe it was waste. You know, I felt very bad, and I also thought, because I believed in Zen, I thought Zen could liberate you in this way. Um, what, what was I going to do then? You know, what was going to work? Um, so I, I kind of 
I remember wandering the streets of New York very sort of upset about this. Um, and the funny thing is, though, that somewhere in the back of my mind, I had uh, read a book in my Buddhist studies classes called Shinran's Gospel of Pure Grace. I had read that book, and it's, my mind remembered, OK, there's two ways. There's self-power, and there's other power. I have exhausted other power. I mean, excuse me, I have exhausted self-power. I've exhausted it. I've done it, and I've discovered for myself experientially, for me at least, this is a dead end. This is the, I'm going, I'm, I'm running in the, in the opposite direction from enlightenment with this practice as I'm doing it now. So I felt that I didn't really have any choice except to just kind of give up, basically. I mean, it sounds kind of stark, but just, just give it up. Like, just stop. Just turn towards other power instead. And even though I wasn't sure I could trust that, I knew that I could not trust myself. I knew that I couldn't trust myself. And I also knew that I couldn't trust, actually, this is going to sound harsh, but I don't mean it that way, I couldn't trust the Zen masters either. Because I could see that some of them could do this practice their whole lives, and some of them could still be uh, kind of very egoistic too. So I knew that if I couldn't trust myself and I couldn't trust other people, I was going to have to trust something even more. I was going to have to put my trust in the power of the Buddha beyond all of these things. So. I ended up going to the Jodo Shinshu Temple uh, in New York, the, the New York Buddhist Church. And uh, even though I looked at it, I was like, what is going on? They're chanting in Japanese. I don't know Japanese. Uh, it's not even Japanese. I find out later. It's Sino-Japanese and all this sort of stuff. But I didn't know what the heck was going on. It looked very Christian to me. Um, Christians were the people I didn't like because they beat me up on the playground. So I was like, I don't know what's going on here. But I just don't have any choice. you know. It's, it's this or it's going to be nothing because I've exhausted self-power. There's no other way. So I kept moving into it, and uh, I discovered that it was what was my path after all. So anyways, that's a rather long story of what was not actually that long a story. <laughs> uh, in fact, that's about how long it actually took in real time, I suppose. Um, there you go. But you asked for it, so unfortunately you got it. <laughs> There was a question over here. Um, I, I'd hope uh, we can hear from this lady. Thank you, Jeff. <clears throat> Thank you, Jeff. My name is Donna. And um, I would like you to comment on the name. Um, well, you know, 120 years ago, the, um, the first missionary um, Buddhist priest came to Hawaii. And probably. Pretty soon, the Honganji was formed. But I don't know when the name, the Hompa Honganji Mission of Hawaii, was instituted. So the word in English, Mission of Hawaii. Yeah. I've always wanted to drop the word mission, personally. This sure. is personally. I thought maybe we've arrived or something. <laughs> you know. But then um, we move on to other, um, the Hompa Honganji. Pahonganji Mission of Hawaii is in Hawaii. The mainland USA is called the Buddhist Churches of America. And the Canada one was called Buddhist Churches of Canada, but I know they changed their name. Yes, it's now very, very long. It's the Jodo Shinshu Buddhist Temples of Canada. Okay. It's a total the mouthful. Jodo Shinshu Buddhist Temples, temples of, Canada. of Canada. Yeah, That's yeah. right. And right up here for the Hawaii Betswing, there's a, there was a small sign if you come in from the back, back way. Uh, I think it said Hawaii Betsuing Buddhist Temple. And about five years ago, Moilili, where I attend, we had to, um, not we had to, we were ready to put a sign. Uh, and what sign should we put on our uh, temple building? And we had some discussion, and at the end, it came out Moilili Honganji Buddhist Temple. You know the word temple versus church? Um, I don't like necessarily temple. I don't think our temple looks like a temple. Our church looks like a temple. But could you just comment on the, the name, the names that we're using? Oh, this is a very good comment. So the, the official title is uh, Hompa Honganji Mission of Hawaii. Isn't that right? Or is there, it's, it's not Buddhist mission, or it's, it's Hompa Honganji Mission of Hawaii. OK, very good. All right, so 
uh, I'll make a comment which will ensure I won't get invited back, and <laughs> that is that uh, I would definitely recommend dropping from Hompa Honganji Mission of Hawaii, I'd recommend dropping the Hompa, the Honganji, the Mission, and probably the Hawaii, too. <laughs> so you will just have to call yourself of from now on. <laughs> of, is, of is a word that people can understand, right? OK. Because uh, uh, honestly, uh, now I don't know exactly when the name arises. I assume it may be 1889 when the uh, first uh, mission is established here. Uh, but I'm not certain. It may be incorporated a little later under uh, Bishop Imamura or someone like that. Um, anyways, it goes back quite a long ways. So we have some problems here with this name. The name is actually a highly accurate descriptive name. But it doesn't communicate itself to anyone except the people who know what it means already, right? So, you know, uh, Hompa Honganji, like, I think even many people don't even know what the Hompa and, and Honganji means. Um, uh, Honganji, you know, is, is, doesn't communicate to anyone unless they already know what Honganji is. And that word mission implies that it is not of and Hawaii. You know, the last two words of Hawaii and the word right before it, mission, these do not go together. Because missions, missions are to Hawaii, right, basically. Uh, their missions are to something. So um, it's, it implies that Hawaii is a mission field from outside. Now, you could think of it differently, that we are the mission uh, bringing things to Hawaii from a place in Hawaii. But usually that word mission isn't used for those kind of domestic you know, outreach programs. So mission almost always means something from over here is going over there. So it sounds like it's coming from Japan to Hawaii always. It sounds like generations later, you know, uh, uh, it's still coming from Japan to Hawaii. So um, I, I think that this name, in fact, is, is a barrier probably to others. Um, like I said, this won't get me invited back because I've now come from a different country and told you your, your name is no good and it's causing you problems. But I think it would be better off if, it, if there were a more inclusive name for the organization. Um, uh, that allowed people to, when they read it in the phone book or online or whatever, they wouldn't go, what, what, is, a, what is a hompa? Is that, is that a, t what, is, what is a honganji? Are, are hompas and honganjis, are, are, they, are, they, are they Buddhist? Are they Muslim? What, it, what are hompas and honganjis? You know, uh, it's a mission, you know, something that, that suggested that it was really from Hawaii uh, or from America or it was just universal in some, some manner. Um, Buddhist Churches of America is different. It also has some serious problems. That name only goes back to the, uh, basically the, the war and post-war period. It was a kind of a survival strategy to look more American. Call yourself Buddhist Churches of America. That sounds a lot better than it was the, uh oh, I'm supposed to know this, but off the top of my head, I'm forgetting a little. I'll pretend it's jet lag. Yeah, that's what it was. OK, so I knew it was mission. OK, so it used to be the Buddhist mission of North America. Changing to the Buddhist churches of America was a step in the right direction. It made it seem more American. But at this, now we've evolved further, and it still seems a little strange. Buddhist churches of Canada, they decided that that didn't convey, that it sounded too Christian or something, even though it's got Buddhist in the title. So then we became, just recently, in the last three years or so, the Jodo Shinshu Buddhist Temples of Canada, which is really long. And I still call it the BCC, because it's, I can say that quickly and move on, right? So um, we're still looking for basic English words to talk about who we are. Um, maybe we need to be something like um, uh, the Buddhist, the Shin Buddhist, uh, I don't know, Shin Buddhists of Hawaii. How about that? That's really simple. I'm not saying it's the best possibility, but off the top of my head, it's something that suggests itself. Maybe if we were Shin Buddhists of Hawaii instead of Hompa Honganji uh, uh, Mission of Hawaii, maybe that would help people realize that we are of Hawaii and not, not to Hawaii, and that we are not a mission that's recent, that we are an organization that's been here well over a century, you know, and, and is, is very Hawaiian. So um, just something to think about. That's a great issue to raise, and, and I, can't, I can't end it here. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Tanabe mentioned that we should break all ties with uh, Japan. How practical or realistic or good is that? Thank you. Okay, good. Uh, it's probably not very practical because there's still a lot of um, uh, this financial support and in particular this ministerial support, which uh, we're not currently at a level where we're able to operate without that assistance. Um, 
I do believe, though, that as a future goal, uh, as much as I, I, I'm really not an anti Honganji person, frankly. I'm probably more conservative than a, a fair number of people in that way. Um, I don't consider it to be perfect at all, but um, I, I just I see a lot of value in that connection. At the end of the day, though, starkly, I think that the only really healthy future for Jodo Shinshu in the West is indeed to become fully independent from Honganji, from Japan, and to go its own way. Um, that's really just, I think, realistically, the only thing that can, that can work. We have to uh, be reliant on ourselves to produce ministers, and we have to probably ordain them in the US. We probably have to train them in English, you know, um, et cetera, because uh, it's just, you know, otherwise we're, we're just going to continue to shrink, I think. You know, um, again, sometimes strengths are also weaknesses. The strength of the connection that we had to Japan helped sustain us for generations and is an important part of our history in, in the U.S. But at the same time, it is a weakness because it meant that we weren't, um, we weren't hungry. You know, we had something we could rely on. And if mother, you know, the, the mother of uh, uh, innovation and invention is necessity, right? We didn't have that necessity, so we didn't have the kind of innovation that is needed critically at this point to make sure we have a future. So um, practically, I don't know how we do it um, because we still rely a good bit in various ways on, on, uh, on Japan. But uh, if we had some sort of plan to kind of systematically, OK, in the next five years, we're going to eliminate this. And then in the five years after that, we're going to do this. And then the five years after that, we're going to do that. And then the five years after that, we're going to be done with the process and we'll be fully on our own. I mean, that would be great. Um, I don't know enough about the mechanics. I'm not a minister myself. So there's, there's a, quite a lot of arcane stuff that I don't have access to that is relevant. But we just kind of have to move in that direction if we're going to have a, have a long-term future, I think. Um, the truth of the matter is that even though Honganji is much, much bigger and healthier than Shin in the West, in Japan, Honganji itself is uh, uh, losing members and is not seen as deeply relevant to the average Japanese person, even the average Japanese person of a Shin background. So we are tied to an organization that's healthier in comparison, but it itself is having real growing pains at, at the moment. And maybe we would be better in the long term um, forging our own sort of destiny, I think. Like I say, I, I'm, I'm more pro Honganji than most people. I just, don't, I just don't think it can work in the long term. That's a little depressing. Someone asked me a happy question. 